Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee um, of 2018. The first item on the agenda is item one, which is a decision by the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. We now continue with our business support inquiry, and I would welcome today our three witnesses. First of all, Rachel Brown, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Cultural Enterprise Office. Douglas Westwater, Executive Director, Community Enterprise, and Fiona Godsman, Chief Executive of the Scottish Institute for Enterprise. So welcome to all three of you this morning, and thank you for coming in. Um, if I might start with um, a question, a fairly general question, but about uh, the provision of business support in Scotland for small to medium-sized enterprises at local level. Um, how would each of you describe this and what are the strengths and weaknesses of support for SMEs in Scotland at local level and what can be done to improve that? Now, I should say there's no need to press any buttons. Um, the sound desk will operate uh, these for you. Uh, so if you just indicate by raising your hand if you want to come in or just join the discussion um, as appropriate. So who would like to start on that question? Well, smiles all round, but yeah. no takers. Oh, well, I'll, I'll go, because I'm always Godsman, willing to you. fill a vacuum. Um, so, I think one of the challenges, one of the reasons that we all delayed responding is that we all work with very specialist groups of people. Mm -hmm. So, we quite it's quite hard for us to speak in a kind of generic basis about the needs. Um, so, my organisation, we work with students and recent graduates, and we specifically look, work with students who are very innovative ideas. So they don't really fall into, they're not, it, it's not easy for them just to, to slot into a more generic business advice. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing from that perspective. So when we do use things like business gateway, it is actually when we've got them to a stage, we've quite often been working with them for quite some time on their business idea and their business model before they're even ready to step in and take some, you know, take some of the more generic, here's how you start the business, here's how you set up your, your accounts and all that sort of thing. So once they're at that stage, once we've got ready and they're at that stage, it's actually fairly straightforward because we've already primed them and we're, we're, we're getting them to go in and ask for the advice that we know that will be easily accessible for them at that stage. I'm not sure that's much help for you. Well, well that, it is helpful to hear, obviously, from your point of view, um, the type of individuals you're, you're helping and looking to help. And when you do come to Business Gateway at that stage, once you get to that stage with these um, individuals, how, how do you find the system works then? It depends on the individual that they end up speaking to. I think that's the message mm -hmm. that comes across loud and clear. Mm -hmm. um, you, sometimes you get somebody who's absolutely great, um, but you don't always. As I say, we're kind of, uh, we've got very specialist business advisors who are used to working with innovative young people who've got no experience of business because they are still at university mm -hmm. or college or they're just recently graduated. So they don't have experience of setting up business and they don't have, under, don't have the business language. So if they get somebody that gets them, that's great. But if you get somebody that actually isn't used to dealing with people like mm -hmm. that, then that's quite challenging. Because actually you're very, very smart people, but they'll lack confidence when it comes to the business side and business language. So, you know, if they don't if they get somebody who just basically has a tick box exercise, then they really struggle. They need somebody that can actually coach them through things. Otherwise, you know, you might as well just send them to a website and, and actually that doesn't mm. work because the personal support, the personal engagement and actually somebody saying, well, you know, the personal shopper, if you like, that's really what they need. Mm. Um, Rachel Brown. The, I would agree with everything that Fiona said. I think one of the interesting um, comments that we always get when clients come and speak to us either before going to Business Gateway or after going to Business Gateway is the, 
the lack of understanding of the entrepreneurial activity that they want to develop. So it's not necessarily that people want to start with a, a business idea and, and take it through a general process. It's the fact that they want to do something entrepreneurial or something interesting. And especially within the creative industries, um, that becomes a very specialist and niche place to develop an idea quite quickly. So the generic support around business support is really very good. And actually, Businessgate, we do a lot of creative um, industry um, um, meetings and engagements and, and, it, and the, web, the website information is really, really pretty thorough. Where it falls down is, is that person-to-person -person contact that is the specialist that has perhaps been involved in that situation before or knows the choices to make between an entrepreneurial activity and, and a straight kind of business startup. Mm. We specialise in, in the SME space um, within the creative sector and I often describe it as, as the canary in the coal mine around portfolio working. So generally speaking, a lot of the creatives we work with might do several different things. And this type of business activity is one thing, and it's rarely linear. So when they go to Business Gateway with an idea around setting up the business, it may come across as a lifestyle choice rather than um, an employment opportunity. And that can get lost in translation often. Um, I have to say, though, that we see an equal amount of people go to Business Gateway with an, a really positive experience and come to us when they're ready for specialist support. And we also see a lot of people that are referred straight to Business Gateway from um, to us who require specialist support straight away. So we've got we, we've got a, a, an even um, experience in so far as the numbers that people. Um, I'm just looking here. We've we've had round about um, 113 people referred to us from Business Gateway um, mm. this financial <clears throat> year, and we've referred 75 to Business Gateway. So it's it, it's a recognition that there's a there's a niche somewhere, and that that they're playing their role and we're playing our role. Yeah, I um, think in terms of personally, see, see that we were pausing at the beginning, and getting us to shop isn't going to be the problem. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I suppose our niche in terms of community enterprises is, is social enterprises. So we're, that's our, our, our role is supporting social businesses from the very tiny little community groups up to multi-million pounds uh, businesses, but they're coming from different perspectives. So I think our experience of Business Gateway is very much what um, Fiona and Rachel have said. It can be very, very good and it can be very, very not good. Uh, and it's quite a bit of a postcode lottery. And I'm certainly not going to name and shame, but some areas will simply get a referral from a, what they view as a social enterprise and think, well, you're not one of us, so you're actually something else. Mm -hmm. And that's where that referral mm -hmm. comes to us. The business gate, we simply lifts the phone and says, well, these guys are actually a social enterprise. That's in your world. And they come across to us and they don't really engage with them. Um, I will maybe name and praise, but in our, where we're based in, in, in one of our offices in West Lothian, the business gateway there, we, there we have our, almost an informal tripartite arrangement with ourselves, social enterprise network and the business gateway advisor. And it's excellent. It's just mm -hmm. very, very good. Um, and it gives three different perspectives. So we had one project in a bit of difficulty. And um, you know, some people were trying to say, well, you need a wee bit of cash. You can go for awards for all, get a grant, sort yourself out. Um, and as soon as she went with us and met with Business Gateway, the, the advisor said, yeah, you have a cash flow difficulty. You need to liquidate some of your assets. Um, and she needed to hear that commercial language. Um, and that worked very well. I think that partnership approach that we have in that and other areas um, works very well. So when it's just, when the referral that mm -hmm. Rachel's talking about is simply a mm -hmm. lifting the phone, yep. can you help these guys? It's not quite so yeah. good. Yeah. All, right. All right, thank you. And uh, now Jackie Bailey. Um, I want to develop that theme of partnership working because obviously you are individually quite specialist organisations um, and I'm keen to know the extent of the collaboration, engagement, partnership working that, that does go on because as Douglas described, I think that's a model that works. But did it arise informally? Are there formal partnerships? It is the, the kind of beneficial place to be beyond referral and much deeper working? So I'd be interested in your views. I mean, yes, um, in theory. I mean, we don't. We have a formal relationship with Business Gateway, as in we are their creative partner. Um, but as as uh, my colleagues have described on the ground, that's ad hoc. Um, we don't have any formal partnerships, um, although we are developing one with Glasgow City Council, um, in the recognition that specialist support is required. Um, but we do tend to, um, we do tend to get referrals just as Douglas described, in a, 
ad hoc, they don't fit our system, they must fit yours way. The challenge we've got is we're, t in comparison, we're tiny. Um, and we can never meet the amount of inquiries um, that we get. So having a much more collaborative approach where there's a deeper understanding of who we actually deal with and the needs and wants of that sector would be really helpful. So we deal with business model of choice. So we deal with social enterprise, we deal with commercial, we deal with high growth. We also deal with any subset of the creative industries of which there are 16. So that can often be, be quite confusing for people because they go, well, is it, are we a dancer, is it an artist, is it digital, is it tech? It's all of those things, but the key point that sometimes gets missed within Business Gateway is that we, we deal with people at, at transition points of their business journey. Mm -hmm. So if they're having leadership challenges or financial challenges, or they've got an idea that didn't work and they want to try a new idea, which is very common in our sector, that, that gets lost. So having a deeper collaboration where people could really understand the needs and wants of the sector would be hugely helpful and actually quite world leading. I think um, it's worth saying, you know, our dedicated office is the only office of its kind in Europe that is, and, and it's similar with my colleagues here. Scotland has a really rich landscape um, that we're not, we're not threading together as well as we could be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think just picking up that collaboration, I think it's, it's, it's really a fundamental question and it works, things work best when yeah. people collaborate. The biggest problems that we have internally is partnership and collaboration when people let us down or we let them down. Or, so it's difficult, it's challenging, it's, it's not perfect, but I think we get better results when people work well. And we certainly find, um, particularly, but, but not just the business support, um, we all certainly find with an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial idea, which as we were discussing before, can be a group of people. It's not always just a, you know, the archetypal entrepreneur. It can be a bunch of people with an idea to develop. Um, when we look back and see how things have worked really effectively, it's when you've got a group of people who have a fabulous idea. Well, I don't have a lot of ideas, um, uh, but I can help people to get where they want to go, and, but they can't maybe sometimes, so they get stuck. So we find people with hugely brilliant ideas, but if we get the right business support in beside them and the right funding and investment, those kind of three things, and maybe maybe fourth thing, maybe networking, mm -hmm. so they're talking to other like-minded people, um, that's where we think see sustainability and success. And often um, there can be just business support or just funding, or they're just a member of a network. Um, and if we can bring not only just partnership and business support, but partnership with networking, funding, and those other bits, um, that, that, that networking beyond just business support, I think is really effective. But very briefly, it is ad hoc, it's not formalised, and it's based on who I happen to know over the last few years of having worked as Fiona and Rachel. You build your own networks as business gateways do, so it's, it, is quite, it can be quite ad hoc. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we don't, we don't have any formal relationship with business gateway. We don't get referrals from them. Um, we will see... Uh, we're, we're normally working at quite small scale as well because we're very specialists, we're looking for the innovative student ideas, but we'll see 300 students, um, new students every year. We're working with a cohort of 100 who have got definite intent, who are definitely developing businesses, and of those, we'll probably refer them all at, one, at some point to Business Gateway for the, this, you know, access to market reports or access to the kind of workshops, etc. that they'll do. We don't get referrals back from Business Gateway and they probably don't actually know that we exist. Because I'm sure some students will probably go to Business Gateway um, first because they'll have heard of it without coming to us or without going to their own university or college enterprise. And we don't see them coming back to us at all. Our biggest challenge, we've only got three business advisors because we're quite small. So although we're working with every university and college and really any innovative student um, the ones that you hear about nowadays, the really bright, smart ones have come through us, but there's only three of our business advisors and there's a lot of different business gateway offices, so we don't have that strong personal relationship. We used to have, uh, with Scottish Enterprise actually, we used to have with the kind of entrepreneurial team at Scottish Enterprise, and we used to refer the high growth potential students straight there, and we had one 
key contact at Scottish Enterprise who would then signpost the students to the relevant people. But when, since the system has changed and you get the high growth support from Business Gateway, we've lost that um, single point of contact for us as an organisation. And I think that might well be beneficial, actually, to have somebody within the Business Gateway network that could actually be the point of contact for the specialist organisations such as ourselves um, to make sure that we get the we've got that good strong relationship going so that we can refer people to the right people in business gateway. Do, do you network with others? Do you get I mean oh, there are people in the private sector who would ordinarily come in and maybe do this uh, kind of thing? Absolutely. I mean I think that's one of the key. We yeah. we all know each other, you know, okay. we all um, the Scotland Can Do Forum, for instance, which is massive now, we tend to all know each other. Okay. We know where to signpost people out. Certainly we we'll refer people to reach organisation, we refer them to the innovation centres, for, we refer them to especially we're our own network, private contacts, okay. to get that right early stage um, advice. That's the networking part, which is absolutely vital. And we've got very, very strong and diverse networks to refer people to. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Angela Constance. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, I'm sorry to mention the B word, uh, that's Brexit, yeah. uh, but I wondered if the impact of Brexit will necessitate uh, the need for different support for SMEs, social enterprises, start-ups, uh, and if so, um, you know, why and who should provide and how. And I suppose more specifically, given that ERDF and uh, European structural funds um, have made a, a huge contribution uh, to business support services, I wondered whether you had any views on uh, sustainability as we move forward. Yeah, so, Ms. Brown. Yeah, so we we're seeing some we're seeing two very interesting things um, with with the Brexit conversation. One positive, one negative. Um, to start with the negative, um, from the get-go, our clients are global. If you're involved in music, it doesn't matter if you live in Greenock or you live in Caithness, you can sell your product globally, um, and that's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge because um, we know that festivals are not able to book people fast enough now. There's been a halt on people's ability to trade their IP. Um, across Europe in particular. The rest of the world has been always been slightly problematic, especially the US when it comes to music. Um, but actually this is sort of, it's almost stunted activity. Um, if people are, are not able to get to the book festival they're supposed to get to or the music festival they're supposed to get to to, to sell their trade. A lot of the clients we work with, um, yes, they might be a musician, but they may they might make more money on songwriting or their IP exchange. So there's a kind of there's a miss, m missed opportunity and a misunderstanding of what's really needed. In terms of business support for that, is actually we've done a lot of helping people through crisis. Um, so you know, costs have gone up 20% in some key areas. How do people manage that when it was unexpected? So that's that's been really quite challenging. Um, and it's been really quite challenging because we've lost people to other cities in the UK um, because there is maybe more robust support, Bristol being one of them, Cardiff being another, Manchester being another. Inevitably, you know, overall 40% of the creative industries sit within London, but actually um, we see Scotland and in particular Glasgow as a bit of a global gateway. So you can get a little bit obsessed with London. It's the smaller cities that are the challenge. Um, in terms of uh, business support, it becomes more about life um, support as well as the business aspect of it. Um, and that's where the positive message comes through from Brexit. We are seeing a lot of what we've been calling creative returners back to Scotland. So lots of people that want to come home and people that want to um, recognise that they and they want to have their creative career from Scotland. And we've got the right ecosystem to make that happen but we don't have the joined up approach yet so people are coming who may have had a career in London for 20 years have chosen to come back to Glasgow and Dundee in particular we're seeing a lot of traffic um, but how do we how do we hook them in to largely um, a, 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 an industry that is built on individuals 
So people are paying 40% tax. They are having a portfolio career, um, but there's not an easy route in because it's considered linear. And we were talking about this um, earlier on, that everybody we work with comes in and out of the system at key points. It's not a linear journey. Um, and so some people may have what would be cons um, a, a good year um, and then maybe a bad year. In the creative industries, that's par for the course. And um, it's very difficult for people to find the right type of support from that point of view. And, and from an ERDF um, uh, point of view, we don't, we, we've never received any European money. We, we're largely funded as a project because we're a specialist organisation. So it hasn't had an effect on us, but it has had an effect on where we can send people to. And there are definitely um, gaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Douglas? I, well, I suppose I'm going to answer it from a slightly different perspective, maybe, um, because we were discussing this at our, internally, our, our strategy, and we have 20 staff from different perspectives who do, do various marketing and market research and community development, all sorts, to nurture business from quite an early stage and develop social enterprises from there, and they tap into lots of support. Um, and the common theme that I have been having in the last few months, maybe year, partly to do with Brexit, but not solely, is that um, we don't. Is that there is a reduction in funding and support, the levels of support. So, um, if that's coming in, and I looked at that question and thought, well, honestly, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. But we are certainly seeing the volume of business support um, available reducing. People are having less time, but demand going up mm -hmm. because people are being asked to be more entrepreneurial and develop businesses, and those people are quite new to it and therefore need support. So, demand's going up and the supply is going down. Um, but I think in t chatting to a lot of people who provide some support of different kinds are saying, well, we don't have enough, and we don't have enough, we, need, we, don't, we don't have enough resources. And there's a, there can be a wee bit of a poverty mentality. Um, and actually, we're, there are other ways to do things. So there was quite a traditional route years ago where people come with an idea and they get lots of support and a business plan and financial planning and a marketing strategy and, and funding and investment. And, and actually, it was the, actually, now we're saying that doesn't exist now. So we need to find new ways of doing things. And again, if you'll forgive me using an example, we're trying to build a business support infrastructure around 10 organisations in the borders. And it's a struggle. It's quite light in terms of what's available. Um, and actually what we did is we, we thought, well, there's four organisations doing something similar, probably five or six years down the line. And we spent £700 taking those people to visit those other folk for a day, and it was transformational. And they're now implementing new business practices simply through seeing like-minded people who have mm -hmm. done that. So, you know, I think that almost circumvented quite a lot of business support that would have been put in from scratch just simply talking to similar people. And that was just one example where I think we can be smarter at providing business support in different ways mm -hmm. um, to deal with what is essentially cuts. But rather than moaning about the cuts, it's just finding a cleverer way to do things. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Godsons? Yeah. Um, this could be very interesting. Uh, as I say, we work with, with students and recent graduates and I would say that, uh, I don't have the statistics, um, but I would say that well over 50% of the students and young graduates that we're working with who have got innovative, high growth potential businesses are actually not from Scotland, not even from the UK. Um, mostly Europe, sometimes beyond Europe as well. At the moment, they're still here. Um, we. They are always incredibly positive about the support that they get in Scotland. They find Scotland a very, very good place to do business. Now, these are students who are not native to Scotland, but who have studied here, who are the brightest individuals, the people that you really, really want to be here, and, who, and they really want to be here too. I don't know what's going to happen with Brexit, because if we don't have these people coming here, we're not going to see the same level of graduate startup um, in Scotland, because we're not seeing these individuals. An example, we have a, a, a very successful young company called MindMate, who were started by two German students, and I think the third one was from Mexico, um, who have had 
hundreds of thousands of pounds of investment have done extremely well. They started off in Scotland. They've got support from several different organisations, ourselves, Scottish Edge, Converge, yourselves. Great bunch of people. Um, they had the opportunity to be in an incubator in Berlin. They chose to stay in Scotland. They went to Techstars in New York, which they found an amazing experience. They came back to Scotland. So there's, we offer a lot to these individuals. Um, but at the moment, as I say, they're coming here and they're still studying here. But I don't know what, what will happen in the future if we don't have these people coming. And they have a, a, an effect that it's probably quite difficult to measure. I do think that um, it's not that international students are better than Scottish students. I think it's the ones who choose to study abroad are probably more entrepreneurial, more innovative, more open to new ideas because they're, they're, they're traveling to study. So we are capturing the best of the best, really. But the knock-on effect is, uh, is when you're networking and when you're bringing the Scottish students together with these people, that confidence really rubs off. Um, and so you get, the, you get the homegrown talent actually really benefiting. It's the effect of competition, I guess, as well, that actually it raises the level at which everybody plays by having these really bright, smart people here. So what will happen after Brexit to people like that? I really don't know, but they'll have other choices and they won't come to Scotland, will they? Thank you very much uh, for those fulsome answers. Um, moving on to my next question, which is changing uh, subject, I would be interested in the panel's views on how our approach to um, embedding equalities in business support, how that could be more mainstreamed, how that could be improved. And, you know, how does the, the business support landscape reach underrepresented groups, whether that's women, whether that's the black and minority ethnic community, people with disability, uh, or indeed folk who live in more uh, disadvantaged uh, areas? Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Douglas Westwater, because I know you have some experience in this area. <laughs> uh, well, speaking as a white middle class male uh, <laughs> without a disability. Yeah, well, I'm glad you've checked your privilege. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think that's, the equalities thing is incredibly interesting. I think we were very briefly talking about this earlier on. I think where we find equalities coming through um, in issues is where businesses are developed not starting from a business idea, but starting from the social need. And actually the business, the entrepreneurialism comes later, the business comes later. Um, if I can give you one example, which I think is, is very interesting, literally just happened a few days ago, I, I was doing some training with uh, a funder, a grant funder who gives uh, grants to um, women and girls suffering from domestic violence. So these are entirely grant funded um, organisations and I was asked to go in and speak around sustainability because the funder's thinking, well, when this fund finishes, these groups are, where are they going, you know, three years down the line. Um, a lot of the groups were kind of struggling to think of ideas, how do you commercialise the women's refuge, it's quite difficult. Um, but one, one, um, one woman kind of said, and she simply came out and said, well, I'm not, I don't know, this, I don't know whether this will work, but actually we have a lot of women who we support who have had very challenging backgrounds in domestic violence and very difficult situations. We've, we re take them out, give them some support, help them get into supported accommodation. And generally they're on their own, not always, sometimes with their children. Um, and they're protected and so on. And she said, of course, the big problem is as they move into a tenancy, they'll inevitably need uh, a cooker plumbed in or a set of shelves put up or a plumber because they've got a blocked drain or something. And she said, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, that trades man is going to be a tradesman, it's going to be a male, and, and that's a real issue because people are frightened. And they ha they're, they're... So she said, I just suddenly thought, well, maybe, um, maybe we need to train up some women to be plumbers and electricians. And, uh, and, I sh and she said, I've thought about that idea simply to address the issue around fear. But she suddenly thought, well, maybe that could be commercialised. Um, and we talked in that, I mean, everybody got all very excited and we've suddenly we've got a national women's-led trades person project. But that example is very common, whether it's disability or drugs or environment or whatever it might be. People come addressing a need 
and you're a third of the way into the idea before you suddenly think, oh my word, this needs sustained, and the business comes out at that point, rather than, you know, they don't come to Business Gateway or Just Enterprise or, or these business right at the beginning saying, I've got a business I want to run, I need a business plan. It's, it's based on need and addressing the need, and then, oh goodness, we need to sustain it, and that's the point where it, it can become a business. So the impact of that on the type of support that needs to be available and provided is what then? Well, I think the type of support needs to be incredibly sensitive. And that is, that is, I mean, a lot of the social enterprise support we do, which is why we are the great advocates of working very, very closely with Business Gateway, but having just enterprise and others as specialist business support, because there is a social impact and there's the business impact, and they often compete. And they often, they, so if we are working with, for example, these simple, simple things like a, a, a homelessness organisation, who many of you may know doing uh, woodwork and creating wood, wood items, and on one hand, they can say, well, you can create this, build, build me a thousand planters. Totally solves their financial, big margins, the business will fly. But these younger people with mental health issues and drug addiction need to find something very creative. And they work for months on a high, bespoke, beautiful cabinet, and they sell it for a thousand pounds. Um, so the social impact is very, very high, the financial margins are very low. So that constant discussion between the financial imperative and the sustainability of the business and the social impact is constantly there. Now often a business advisor uh, will say to them, well, that's a stupid decision, build your planters. Uh, and often somebody with too much of a social impact will say, those folk in business, they, you know, actually it's all about the... Then if you need both, then they're constantly clashing against each other. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Godsman? Yeah, um, so we work with probably quite a privileged group of people because we are working with people in generally in full-time education, and most of them are universities. But I, I think in terms of the specialist support, I think um, one of the things, and I speak from someone who's involved in one of the, the colleges as well, so I think... Um, I think a lot of it is to do with building confidence in people and giving them a belief in themselves right at the get-go. So way before they even think that they might have a business idea. And I think for that, that's where you need the specialist social enterprises and the specialist projects that are targeted at particular demographics. Mm -hmm. um, so you think of organisations, for instance, like Radiant and Brighter, who work with you know, you're aware of. Um, an awful lot of what they're doing is building confidence, building a community. People walk into a room where they're comfortable, where they know the people. Um, and, and from that and that encouragement, that's how you start to build up, you know, the, the ideas, the people that might actually have ideas that ultimately become business. But they still need that level of hand-holding and they need that confidence boost before they'll walk through the doors of Business Gateway. So I think there's an awful lot around specialist projects that are targeted at specific demographics and I think again with the um, Clyde College they've got projects where they're involved with with students who've 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 uh, of, of young people in refugee community and, and young people in refugee community and actually building their confidence uh, and, and their abilities and, and really you know you work with groups of people like that without focusing on actually you have a business opportunity or you could be an entrepreneur, you could start a business, there's an awful lot of groundwork that needs to be done before that. And I think that has to be done by specialist agencies and generally probably social enterprises are, are probably the best at doing that. But having the links then between these social enterprises and the business gateway support is probably the key thing, that, that these relationships and partnerships with the organisations and support for these organisations is mm -hmm. probably the key thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Ms Brown? So the majority of people we work with are freelance, portfolio, self-employed um, creatives. So um, uh, there's a real interesting challenge there with generic support because how do we ensure fair work? And when, you, when there isn't an employer, there's a customer. And sometimes our experience has been that um, the customer is king in terms of general support. So the advice that's been given to the, the freelancer or the individual has always been focused on, you've got to do what your customer asks, do what your customer asks. We've done a lot of work on, on and we support fair work. So how do, you, how do you encourage people to negotiate the correct contract? How do you encourage people to have the right type of approach um, and, be, and, and, and be valued and viewed 
Um, especially, just as an example, a specialist project we are doing a, is engaging with um, creatives who have long-term health conditions and how can we support them to continue to work as creatives, given the fact that our industry is 24-7 and you can be trading in, in America and, and not leave your bedroom if you don't want to. How do we make sure that's a positive experience? Um, and that sort of, that, as my colleagues have described, that very nurturing, enabling environment changes slightly the, 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 the type of business support that you give um, and the way that you give that business support because it's on the needs of that particular customer. So we, we deliver business support at 7 o'clock at night, at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, if that's appropriate and relevant. There's nothing 9 to 5 about our service mm. because it has to be reactionary to um, our clients. We do see the majority of... Um, creative entrepreneurs coming through that want to make a successful business are 45 plus at the moment. Um, we're seeing a large increase in female founders and we're seeing a large increase um, in the BME community coming forward. And I think it's about building, com other organisations have built confidence to then pass on to us, but we have been the specialist, not the generalist. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Well, thanks, Convener. Thanks, Jill, for coming this morning. Um, the, the government's quite focused now on the, the new strategic board that came out of the Enterprise and Skills Review, which um, is designed to bring coherence to, to High and Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Funding Council, etc. How much contact have you had with the national organisations responsible for business support? And to what extent do you think um, the relationship between Business Gateway and some of these national agencies uh, is working? Well, I suppose we, if, I, if I'll briefly start, I suppose it is, has been very different. Per personally, <laughs> I have no idea how that's going to go, but we, we, we will certainly more than welcome that kind of decision, that sort of strategic decision. Just absolute grassroots experience, so not talking strategically particularly, but uh, we work across Scotland, we do a lot of work in Highlands and Islands and, uh, and have done, um, and across the central belt and cities and towns. Um, working with High has been just different. Um, you immediately have contact with local development officer because of that mix of community and, um, and enterprise. Uh, you just immediately have a route in. Uh, and we have relationships with Highlands Islands Enterprise easily and strongly and work very jointly work with them. Our relationship with Scottish Enterprise has been honestly um, pretty nil. Uh, it's been in very, very difficult to get in. There's one person who's excellent, but one person in the whole organisation responsible for social enterprise, and she's great, but it's quite hard to get a route in. It is absolutely changing. I've seen a real difference in the last six months or a year and a more openness, transparency, it's been great. But that's been a real difference. So um, trying to take some of the learning from High and, uh, and using that, I think, will be very, very valuable. And I hope that the South of Scotland organisation, when it appears, has that joint community and enterprising approach, because that's, I think, where sustainability works well. So I've certainly seen a positive change. But um, getting into the specialist support of Scottish Enterprise for social enterprises has been very challenging. And we've had a few examples where they've gone and gave Business Gateway have said, well, we're your gateway in and we'll try and get you into the, the high tech support, for example, um, uh, exporting, that kind of thing. And there has been a real barrier of actually getting that support in, uh, with Scottish Enterprise. Even, even when you're going through Business Gateway? Yes. Yep. Well, why, why is that? Um, uh, I'm not sure really, to be honest. I think it's partly perception. I think there's a perception a lot of the people we are coming to them with aren't proper businesses, they're not commercial enough, their language isn't right. Um, yeah, I'm not, honestly not quite sure, but we've tried to get some support there and it's been difficult. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we as at one stage we had some funding directly from Scottish Enterprise and as a result we had a key contact at Scottish Enterprise and things worked extremely well. Um, that person was the, the, the basically our route into a huge amount of support in Scottish Enterprise and that person fully understood the types of people that we were putting forward for them and, and directed them to the right level of support. I think one of the challenges that we now face is that we're working with people who have absolutely, without a doubt, high growth potential. 
but that hasn't been proven because they're still at very early stage. They need access to the specialist support. They'll hugely benefit from interventions from the right people, but they don't necessarily tick the right boxes at that stage. So it can be very challenging to go through business gateway into the business gateway high growth team and actually say, look, this person really, we know we've been working with them. This person needs that specialist support and needs it now. We, you, know, you can't wait until they've actually ticked a box, achieved a certain milestone, because actually if you're working with very innovative uh, organisations as we are, innovative ideas, uh, with patents, it's actually a long journey before they actually are starting to maybe tick the financial thresholds, because actually there's, there's still, you know, you're talking about people that are getting investment, but are not actually making any money yet, and how do you get the right sort of support from them? The other challenge that we have, our funding comes from the Scottish Funding Council, there's still a lot, there's still a big silo mentality between the different organisations, and we quite often hear about projects that have been started, where we actually are very well qualified to either advise or actually deliver on some of the work, but it's actually been given to somebody else who needs to start from the bottom, where we could actually either work with them and, and start from a higher level, or actually we could hit the ground running because we've got that expertise. But people in, in the Funding Council or Scottish Enterprise or whatever actually don't know of our existence because we're, you know, we work with a particular department and the other department who doesn't know what we're doing. And that is a challenge that we see again and again and again and, and it finds very, very frustrating. And does that have a direct effect on some of the people you're working with? Or are you just saying that the yeah. effectiveness of the national agencies is not as good as it could be because they're No, not no, no, it does have a direct effect on the people that we're working with because if we can't get them the uh, timely advice that they need, that has a real knock-on effect. I mean, you could stop somebody. When you're working with some... We're working with really bright young people. Um, if they keep hitting their head against... And they don't have the money. You know, they're recent graduates. They're used to surviving on a shoestring. They don't have a big... You know, they don't have a mortgage. They don't have family to support. I mean, one or two of them might, but most of them don't. So there, it's not that they're kind of looking for large sums of money. They Actually, they need the money. They need the advice to get to the next next stage of their business. And if they don't get that, they may well be offered a graduate job somewhere and go and do that, and you lose that potential. So it has a real knock-on effect. And it's simply because you can't get access quickly enough to the support you need. It's, it, you know, okay, you're in the system and somebody will get back to you, but two or three months later is actually no good because actually by then they'll have to have maybe um, diverted to plan B and plan B could take them outside of Scotland. Can I just very briefly, you know, if, if you don't mind, um, just very, very briefly, I think something just maybe comes, I was thinking when you asked your question, but I think the perspective can be quite different. So. Scottish enterprise and business support, often business support, is about um, the perspective of coming from growth. So you, we will give you support to help you to grow, to grow by X hundred thousand a year, X hundred staff. We want you to franchise. We want you to, to become bigger. Um, there's a big issue with that in our sector. Some people want to grow, and we would welcome that. I'm certainly not anti-growth by any stretch of the imagination. But a lot of our enterprises are very happy to be who they are. So they might come and say, we want to develop a shop locally and want to do some innovative stuff around e-commerce. But we want to be in that village in Fife. We're not interested in having 10 shops or 20 shops or 100 staff. Or, so growth is a real issue. A lot of our clients are running very effective, sometimes high turnover businesses, but growth, the growth for what? You know, the last, well, why? Well, so growth is an issue. That, that commitment to growth, uh, Scottish Enterprise comes from that perspective, and a lot of our clients don't. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but certainly a lot of them. A lot of the clients that we deal with um, are trend setters. So um, they're bringing the pre-idea. So Skyscanner would be a good example of people that were working within the Culture Enterprise Office for two years before those ideas were developed. So um, it's very difficult for us to bring that to the table um, uh, with Scottish Enterprise because the growth that, that um, a lot of the uh, creatives that we work with might not be seen for two or three years' time, but actually the level of expertise they need 
is actually at a different level. It's not that we're starting from a baseline and we work our way up in terms of advice and support. Mm -hmm. It's that actually there's something really interesting bubbling here. How do we get the right the right type of investment around them, the right type of um, support and mentoring around them, so when they're ready to grow, it can explode. Um, it's very difficult for us, I think, in the creative sector not to be treated as a lifestyle business. Most mm. people understand digital. If I went to a, with a digital high growth project, no matter what it did, we would probably get some level of investment and support because people can understand now the mechanisms of the impact that can have. What we always try and say, and it's, I think my colleagues have said the same thing, is that what would it look like if we had 100 businesses or 500 businesses or 1,000 businesses all turning over half a million quid in our local areas, all turning over a million pounds in our areas, looking at fair work policies, looking at how we can distribute a pipeline, looking at how we can have a social impact, a creative impact and an economic impact. And we're talking about um, growing a sector rather than growing individual businesses. That seems to be, for us certainly in the specialist space, where all the trends and the supports and where other cities are doing well. Bristol are doing that brilliantly. Um, Cardiff are starting to recognise that hub approach and doing that brilliantly. So it's about the wider inclusive growth piece rather than the linear growth. Um, we work similarly with colleagues. We work great with Highlands and Islands. We, 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 we've started a really productive relationship with the South. Um, but it's people's perception of what growth and scale is in the middle that's holding that. Most of our businesses don't take a linear approach to growth. It can be almost boom and bust, but that's quite healthy. Um, and then it can have an impact on other communities and other areas. And I feel that that gets missed. Yeah, I think that's that, that probably the, the point I was trying to make as well about getting access to that specialist support is actually we're working with individuals that actually probably need to leapfrog a few stages. Um, and, and that's where it gets really difficult because we know these people with huge potential. And if you make them jump through... In, go from one level in, in incremental <laughs> steps, actually they're ready to leap from boom yeah. to boom. You know, we had a young guy, um, Snap 40, who a uh, medical student at Dundee, and um, you know, within a year he'd got significant investment in, in his company, and, and you know, it, the, the speed at which he developed was phenomenal. Um, and and, and you need to be able to support that as well as the ones that, that are slow and steady um, and maybe take a, li a little longer to get there. But actually, the outliers, the ones that you go from here to here fast, sometimes you just don't get the right sort of support at the right time for them. OK, thank you very much. <coughs> and Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, clearly, given the diverse organisations that are involved here, there, it's very important that everybody's heading generally in the same direction. And I wonder, to what extent are local support services, including Business Gateway, aligned with existing policy? And how do we ensure that appropriate cross-policy connections are made? So I think that's quite difficult to answer from, from, the, from a perspective. So as a specialist organisation, we think we are fully aligned with um, the direction of travel from Scottish government point of view. We see how we see very much the impact um, on our uh, on our um, customers around inclusive growth, innovation, especially. Those are the two areas that keep coming up, and we see we're we're perfectly aligned. And, and all of the organisations that we see and the individuals we see are quite ambitious in their own space. It's difficult where that breaks down into local level because there's sometimes our competing priorities, especially at, we're based, we're head office in Glasgow. Um, often the local geography can play a big part in that. So they might want to see more businesses housed in a particular geography of the city or um, within a particular locale around an office block that, that needs to be filled. And there's a kind of pressure around the, the local impact there. And can business can you just confirm who they are? They, I know, sorry. I was being polite. Um, the, so with Business Gateway in our local area in Glasgow, there is, a, there is often a push to fill a particular building, um, often a push to develop a particular set of resources that the city need. The organisations or the clients that we work with might have bigger ambitions than that. Is that push from the council? Um, I would expect... 
suspect it's probably a, a, a mixture of things, yes, probably a push from the council. It definitely can be a push from peers as well, um, and it can be a push from different sectors. So if you're working with social enterprise, for example, or if you're working um, sometimes within further in higher education, you wouldn't want to lose um, students from a particular area. So we have that definite challenge with Glasgow. Glasgow University at the moment, where we're keeping everybody together in Glasgow University, rather than letting the students be a bit more ambitious and going off and doing other things. I think there is a real need to understand um, the, mar the pace of the market at the same time as the pace of the support and the pace of what people want to achieve in a particular locale. So if the pace of the market dictates that somebody um, wants to go from zero to hero in 18 months, they should be allowed to do that. They shouldn't have to go through the steps of, let's be based in this geography for a little while, let's move through this sector development programme, let's be part of this academic group. They should be able to, to do that. And our experience, certainly with the creative industries, is there's not that freedom at a local level. It's still very much gate-kept as you go through and sometimes the ambitious ambition of the clients that we work with is not fully recognised because it's not fully understood. Anyone else got a comment on that? Um, well, I, I suppose in, uh, it doesn't affect us too much, except that we do find that sometimes it, you know, that it, there are certain business incubators and accelerator programmes where the, the students are being really quite actively pushed into going into this accelerator, which is really not right for them. Um, so that, and, and which you know it's, it's hard to resist because it limits the amount of support that they're going to get. So you know there's an opportunity that there may be elements of what that, that incubator or that elevator program is offering that would be of benefit. But actually to say no, you need to go into this. You need to be based here. Um, if you want to access all of this, that, that that can be a real challenge to kind of squeeze people into these places where they really don't don't need to, to be. These are local pressures which are, which are yes. interesting to hear about. Yeah. It, it's, it's not government policy, obviously. Mm. It's very much at a local level. I was concerned, Pierre Gosman, when you mentioned about silos between yeah. different organisations. How do you uh, align policy when you're working with silos? <sighs> if I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I think you've um, probably just answered it. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's really difficult. It's often people from the outside that actually make the connections. Yeah. I think in some ways, if you don't mind me, I was thinking about some of this when you said mm. that too. I mean, we people, people, well, we're all people. People, sectors, industries come from different perspectives. And I think we're certainly seeing a move. Um, I suppose we sit somewhere in the middle in terms of social enterprise and community business. We absolutely came across it last week, see people who fit on whatever side their community development side who will quote um, the community engagement strategy and they have a policy framework that they work in and the very extreme end of that will say business is bad the profit motive is bad we're here to help people that's ridiculous we don't want to be businesses that's kind of over there and um, and over this side you've kind of got a policy framework around sustainable economic growth and profit and growth and, and, and numbers of staff and economic development and reducing unemployment figures, those sorts of things, and the profit motive becomes really important. Um, and I suppose where, where, where we sit is somewhere in the middle, um, but we are certainly seeing that bigger picture um, beginning to bring those things together. Mm -hmm. Because of reality, the community development guys have to become more business-like. They have to be trading. They have to be sustaining what they do at a local level and starting to buy into the 10-year social enterprise strategy, um, community empowerment, asset transfer, land reform, those kind of things, and take those opportunities and move towards that kind of businessy bit. Um, but the, the guys at this end are beginning to see, well, actually, we need to have fair business practices. We need to reinvest in our community because otherwise people won't buy our stuff. So we have to be nicer. We have to have social enterprise supply chains, environmental policies and so on. And so we're going to see good businesses using that, coming towards the nicer policy framework, but communities moving towards the more commercial policy framework. And so those that national policy around broadly sustainable economic growth we're certainly seeing that, that movement slowly towards the middle and the tanker beginning to point in the direction of basically everybody working towards some level of sustainability. How do you view the level of Scottish Government involvement? Is it significant? Is it light touch? Is it 
Well, our core, our core involvement personally is with the third sector division and largely at the moment through the 10-year social enterprise strategy and the budget beside that. I would say it was significant and substantial. Nothing's perfect, but it's the envy of a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. um, the level of support and specialism we have, um, less so funding, but certainly support, learning, leadership mm -hmm. that Rachel mentioned, things like that, um, is, is enviable. Uh, I think it's I could so you're satisfied it's at the right level to give Oh, I want more. Needed. More and more, please. But uh, there's always a need for more. But um, I would certainly be, we're, I think we're in a, 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 a very, very supportive period at the moment with the Scottish Government, yeah. in my view. Yeah, I mean, certainly when I, um, I'm in Europe or in America, whatever, and I talk about the support that we have in Scotland, people are generally very envious of the support that happens. Or, or in England, my colleagues in do enterprise roles with universities in, in, in England are really amazed at what we have and envious of what we have. If we just come back to you know the, the, the policy question you asked me earlier, I think one of the challenges with the silos is people have individual targets. And people, um, people are not set targets, which, which actually, you know, so or, or not even targets, but in, but objectives, departmental objectives, uh, and people are very focused on these individual objectives without that kind of recognition of what their colleagues in a different department are doing. It's a challenge that um, you see in, in any agencies, and it's a challenge that you sometimes see in businesses as well. Um, but it seems particularly in public institutions, I mean, universities in particular, you know, we're often introducing people in different parts of university who didn't know of each other, who are actually working in very similar things. Um, so, so what can be done, I think actually the enterprise and skills review is, is, a, is a big step in the right direction. I think if you've got people at the top levels talking to each other is great, but the next, you know, you need to have the lower levels equally talking across, across, uh, across divisions and across departments and being actually actively encouraged to collaborate internally as well. And I think that would go a long way to solving some of the silo problems. How effective do you think uh, uh, business support activities are in delivering local economic growth? Is there any measurement? Is there a means of measurement? I, I mean, certainly from a from a creative industries point of view, there's very little measurement. Um, that's a that's a national problem. We don't have as much data as we we need to have from so a. So how do you measure success? So we. We measure the impact of the services that we provide on on the the individuals we work with the journey, and and it depends what the definition of success really is. If the definition of success is high growth, if the definition of success is more employ employment opportunities, if the definition of success is internal and um, international trade, n the, the 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 pace of which the individuals we work with operate at can sometimes. Um, be too fast for um, the structures to keep up with. So, for example, we've got a lot of people in and around the Barras that are doing great trade, great, great trade. They're employing local people. Um, collectively, it's having a really big impact. <coughs> Is it? And we need to sustain that. It's not having the economic growth impact that it can have, um, and that's two or three or four or five years away. Um, but at the moment, it's kind of under the radar. Um, it fits brilliantly with um, the approach that we all want to see. It's regenerating the area. It's having an, uh, an impact on, on people who thought they were unemployable being employed. It's having an impact on new businesses coming to the area. Therefore, new people are visiting the area. The whole thing's just having a much more vibrant feel. Um, so we can measure the impact of our involvement there. Is, is that service, that support service having an impact on economic growth in a significant way, not at the moment. Um, and it can be very difficult sometimes to to justify that when you're in when you when you're when you're delivering those kinds of services. And because we are specialist support, we can see the potential in that and back that idea and make sure that idea can travel. Um, and I don't think the general landscape would have we did that as a bit of a consortium. I don't think the general business support landscape would have been as keen on seeing those activities happen um, because they were not hitting several measurements quickly enough. 
It might be worth just mentioning, sorry, just really briefly, that the, in our social enterprise world, what's been happening relatively recently is they've done a social enterprise census. Yeah. It's, it's flawed, it's not perfect, um, but, uh, but there's been two done so far and the third one due next year. They're done every two years at the moment. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but there's been um, some social enterprises closing, some opening. It's gone from five, just over 5,000 um, uh, three years ago in la last year's notice at 5,600 social enterprises. There's been a growth of turnover that's quantified. So if you look at those social enterprise censuses, that's, there's two being completed and one to be done next year, asking the same questions around turnover, profit margins, numbers of staff, um, local economic development, thematic development, so it, it splits creative industries, health and social care, it splits it. Um, uh, you can have a look at the comparators over the years, so we're certainly beginning to see a gradual increase in turnover, profit and impact locally. Thank you. Um, I'm just conscious of the time here. So that's something you might want to write into the committee to either provide or provide a link to it, and indeed on any of the other questions, if any of you wish to write in with further information on the issues raised today. Are there other committee members who'd like to get questions in? Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've received feedback from other witnesses uh, in terms of the tension sometimes faced between the need for general business support and specialist support, and I think you've touched on it uh, before, but I'd like to take that uh, maybe a bit further and, and ask each of the panel members how you balance the need for general support and specialist uh, sector support, and perhaps provide uh, specific practical examples uh, of how you have achieved that balance uh, of general support and, and specific support. Thank you. Shall I? Well, um, yeah. I mean, suppose we... We've certainly seen that change, and we have a, we have our own business advisors have changed remarkably over the last few years. I've been in the organisation. We had very generic business support advisors, um, because that was what we were very demand led. So we're a social enterprise, and we sell our service to our customers. So we just provide what they need really. Um, supporting somebody with a business plan was very straightforward because people didn't really know what that was. Well, now they do. Um, I've had to change our staffing structure in the left, so we now have a lawyer and an accountant and on our team, which we never had before. So we've had to significantly increase the skills level on our team because mm. the demand from the sector is specialist. Um, I mean, maybe Rachel can comment more on the sector specific because we are not sector specific. So we work in partnership with Community Woodland Association, Community Transport Association, and use their specialism as partners um, in the support we provide. I suppose where we are come is more those broad specialisms. And if you're looking for one example, for instance, we. Um, Procurement's quite significant in some of our sectors, not all, but um, we have had to develop a skill and some support around the detail of 2P transfer because people were simply going, oh, there's, there's a piece of work we can do. The government's telling us to tender. We'll tender and we can deliver that work. And they were seeing the clause that said 2P transfer is eligible here and they didn't know what it was and flicked across it. So we're having to provide quite a bit of support to make people understand the implications of that. So so, so that kind of thing around that allowing 2P transfer, and quite, that's just one example of quite a specialist bit of support. We have things like VAT, those kind of things. So those cross-cutting specialists are things that we have had to develop. So people are no longer looking for just a business plan. They're now looking for very specialist cross-cutting support, but we deliver less thematic yeah. support, which maybe Rachel would yeah. comment on. So we, we don't do any general business support at all. I mean, everything we do is specialist. In saying that, people come to us at the start of their journey because they have a particular question or a particular um, uh, idea they want to develop. Um, one of the challenges that we have, though, is, you know, we are well, the main challenge we have is we're tiny in comparison. I mean, like colleagues here, we have a very small team. We have two in-house advisors. Um, we then use specialist industry associates to bump that up. Um, so we're not able to, to meet the demand um, of the inquiries that we have. But we always pass people to Business Gateway if it is a, a fairly um, straightforward idea. If it is something that somebody wants to set up, they they, they, they want they're, they're they're in a band, they want to set up the structure around them, they've got a bit of an idea, a plan. It doesn't require specialist support because it's a fairly um, vanilla investment. Mm. Then that's straightforward, and we we would always do that. Where it where it's um, interesting, and just as an example, there was a fashion brand that wanted to make high end. Um, tote bags out of recycled firefighter hoses. So if you can imagine going to a general support advisor yeah. to say, I want to do that, plus I want to be a social enterprise, plus I want to 
donate 50% of my profits to the firefighters fund and I want to be a global business by year two. You can imagine, I'm sure, the, the response that would get. That is now an incredibly successful social enterprise called Elvis and Cress. Um, does exactly that. It's a partnership with Burberry. Cameron Diaz has bags. They're on the front page of American Vogue. So it's that kind of thing where the starting point often people um, don't necessarily understand, but that's a multi-million pound business. And we would be delighted to be supporting that from a specialist point of view and making them making those those inroads with that. But if that person goes to general support, they get lost. So I think I think it's really it's kind of um it's it's known when to intervene and when not to. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no, I would agree with, with what Rachel's saying. It's about knowing when to intervene and when not to. So as I say, we work with people from early stage ideas and sometimes it's an opportunity that we've recognised and actually the business can, idea can actually take some some time to develop from that. Mm -hmm. So our specialist advisors can do that kind of coaching and, and the advice to get them to that point. But then they will we will refer to Business Gateway for some of the vanilla support which is which they need, which is great. It means our guys can focus on the things that are really different uh, and make sure that they get the right kind of vanilla support that's needed. Mm. But it's also we also get support from the private sector. So we have students who have ideas that potentially need patent protection, like IP issues. So we have specialist um, professional services that can provide that. Um, or professional legal services that can provide the right support to set up a business that wants to be basically a global business right from the beginning. Mm. So getting all these kind of elements right at the beginning. So it is really a case of having, it's about, I suppose, to be, every, every business needs some bespoke advice and support. Some are maybe 80, 90% vanilla like everybody else and will do very well through Business Gateway. Others are completely the opposite. You know, only 10% it can be that basic. So it's having that person at the right time and it's through the specialist organisations that can do that, really. Okay, Th thank you very much. Just a, a very quick supplemental. Later today, we, today in the Chamber, we've got a debate on uh, digital opportunities, how to, how to take um, forward the, the digital economy. Can I ask uh, each of you, how, if a company or a business comes to you and it looks like they, they need an e-commerce platform or a digital platform to trade globally or, or engage locally, mm -hmm. um, do you provide that specialist uh, digital advice or where do you uh, uh, signpost them to get that specialist advice? Um, so there's three things we would do. Yes, we can provide that ad advice in-house. We have a series of in, um, uh, industry associates who are leaders in their field in that way that's almost like a mentor buddy system. Yes, we would also refer to the appropriate um, Scottish Enterprise support, although, like my colleagues have said, that can be patchy and that's quite difficult to navigate. Um, and then thirdly, we do a lot of private sector um, hookups as well. Okay. Um, and that is where uh, the, the the we find want some of the most robust knowledge Good. is is shareable, and people do want to make other people successful. And mm. um, there's not it's not as competitive um, as people might think. The interesting part is what kind of digital though? Is it digital for digital sake? Is it a digital healthcare platform? Is it a digital um, um, trading platform? There's a whole range of different. Um, um, r opportunities and a whole range of different technicalities that need to be addressed mm. there. Um, but certainly from our point of view, a, a specialist that knows how to navigate not only the creation and the impact, but also the future challenges of, of when things go out of date really quickly. We sometimes find that the public sector support <coughs> is even is, as fast as it is, is even out of date yeah. quite quickly within a quarter. Mm. I, mean, I think really briefly, honestly, it's a gap. It's a, it's a gap out there in terms of the support that we've talked a little around trying to access from Scottish Enterprise, and it has been tough. And it's like, I wonder if it's in there and I've not quite got to it. I mean, I'm not quite happy to blame myself there. I'm not wanting to cast aspersions. I just, I, I have struggled to find access to that for, for our clients. Uh, I think the route that works most effectively, to be honest, is actually not so much to look for support, and if it was there, we would absolutely take it, um, was to support clients that we work with to develop, almost to develop a brief to work out exactly what it is they're trying to do and spend a lot of time doing that. Because they might come saying, I want to do this. Actually, when you get into the guts of it, it's not yeah. really quite that. So we spend a lot of time developing that, days probably, um, and then trying to help them to support, support funding and investment. And we have a number of different, we don't have that in-house, we have a number of different technical coders. So we then go to with a very, very detailed brief and a budget and commission that in the, uh, 
out in the digital sector. Mm -hmm. It tends to be our, our route to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I would just really reiterate what they're saying, that obviously the cohort that we work with are digital natives, and it's maybe less of an issue for them. Yeah. Yeah. But certainly one of the key things is probably the peer-to-peer -peer support, mm -hmm. um, which if we're bringing them all together, actually they learn as much from each other, because as I say, things move so fast, yeah. that actually just simply working with somebody who's a few months ahead of them um, the businesses tend to be very supportive of each other. Thank you. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. We, we've heard this morning that students uh, find Scotland a good place to do business and that in terms of the level of support that's out there, if I picked you up correctly, other parts of the UK find, are very envious of what goes on up here. But in the same instance, I think it was yourself, Rachel Brown, that said that um, Bristol and Cardiff have better support for the creative sector. So how does Scotland compare with the rest of the UK or Europe? And where are the lessons that we can learn and what are they? I mean, from a creative industry's point of view, Scotland is growing um, slower than the rest of the UK. Um, the lessons there are probably threefold. One, we've not quite cracked the understanding of what type of investment the creative industries really needs mm -hmm. in Scotland. Um, so that's a negative thing. A positive thing is that the ecosystem is really strong. Um, the the Can Do uh, Forum is really um, fairly influential within the sector. People people want to um, be part of that. People listen to the other partners around the table. So the the ecosystem is is good. The challenges um, are that, in certainly in areas of Cardiff and Bristol, is that organisations like ourselves have collaborated together come up with solutions, and the implementation of those solutions have been really quite fast. Um, pace of change, absolutely, everybody's feeling the pace of change with Scottish Enterprise at the moment, and that's really positive, but the pace of change isn't fast enough. But what's, what's stopping that collaboration happening now, and then rolling out the solutions you identify? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I mean, certainly, you know, from our point of view, resourcing is, a, is an issue. We're tiny, you know, and, and we, 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 um, we're funded or we're, we're funded only by Creative Scotland, and, and we're going through a transition at the moment. So we're not sure who we'll be funded with going into next year. Might be nobody, might be somebody. So we're in that very kind of challenging position at the moment. Um, so resourcing can be quite an issue. Um, there's no doubt that with Cardiff and with Bristol, they picked key sectors to back and then pushed that forward and everything dovetailed into that. And it's almost like once they've, they've um, conquered that situation, they're going into another one. And we've probably seen that with, with social enterprise, to be honest. There's been a, you know, a decade of investment, a decade of structural and political will to move that forward. And we're all now reaping the benefits of that. Scotland's got more um, businesses with purpose being um, created and evolved than anywhere else. That's real, really envious. The challenge is, is how you start, when you start to flex around the edges, how you then support that. And if people are starting off as a social enterprise, but they're a creative industry and they're flexing into our space, how do we start to support that? So I think I think we're we're maybe at some point trying to do too much, um, and 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 laser focus would be helpful. I think also, especially in cities like Cardiff and Bristol, they've backed an industry like the creative industries, which is a bit of a mystery in some areas. Um, not quite sure what you're going to get, but you, it, and I always describe it as um, how much do you want a gold medal? It's a bit like an Olympic gold medal. You know, what does it take to get that one gold? What do you need to put in at the bottom for it to rise to the top? We're still a bit scattergun in the creative sector around that. We've not consolidated everything yet. Um, and certainly, you know, you've created Scotland, Skills Scotland, Scottish Enterprise are still working out how they work together. In the meantime, the market is just getting on with it. So it's a bit well, disconnected. Before I ask other panel members to come in, um, what would you say the focus should be in Scotland in terms of the creative industries if you want that laser targeted approach? I think there's two things. I think there's the small and then there's the large. I think we can get distracted in the middle sometimes. So we have a huge amount of portfolio career people um, where we don't really understand um, the impact of that. And a lot because of the VAT threshold, p people are are counted and not counted, and we're not quite sure of that landscape, and we're not quite sure of that potential. Could there be really brilliant businesses in and amongst people doing their work? Absolutely. So I think there needs to be a, a, a real focus on, especially in the 21st century, you know, 
people are living and working completely differently. The nine to five doesn't exist in our sector. How are we managing that? Do we have enough space for that? How are we supporting home working? How are we supporting that entrepreneurial activity that can really be transformational? And actually what's fascinating is those groups of people are hugely employable, but they're choosing to be their own employer. How do we support and capitalise that? At the same time, we don't really have as enough um, investment in the system for the high, large businesses. We're still looking at that as a far too linear process. So if you look at some of the people that Fiona's working with, they can be going from zero to probably five, six, ten million in 18 months, and we just don't have the capacity um, to be able to support that. So I think the solutions are very small entrepreneurial activity to be supported and really hotbedded in a way that makes us an envious place to be and then where people can see the high growth potential, which is not the big, it's not a unicorn, it's not Amazon, it's not, it's not that. It's high quality impact industry that is doing something different. The fintech sector is a good example where you're yeah. seeing some really innovative ideas, but they're taking far too slow to get to ground because the money's just not big enough. Okay. Douglas, so Fiona? Yeah, well, I mean, it, the money is the issue, really. Um, if you've got people that are needing the big investment, then, and, and, you know, I used to be in the life sciences sector 20 years ago, we were seeing the same thing. Um, so it's not an easy thing to solve. You get to a point where you need the, the angel community is very good here. So things like Scottish Edge have really plugged a very useful gap that's been fantastic. We send a lot of students in that direction um, for that money to get them off the ground. But it's the ones that are then needing that kind of half a million, a million a bit more investment very early on that's where you start to struggle and that's where they end up disappearing they go off to london or but wherever in terms of learning lessons from other parts of the world or from the rest of the uk is there any anything you can point us to it's really difficult i mean you think you look at things like textiles in the states where they actually bring the investors in um, so that, that people like mine may actually, way before they're ready for it, get that exposure and they get the, and, and the investors see these people with potential very early on. I know that EIE is trying to do that, but I think we need more of that. Um, EIE is very specific as well. Um, you need to see more of, more of that happening. Um, more awareness of the talent that we have in Scotland and exposure to the, 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 the people with the big money, really, and that, that's that's the biggest gap. In, ter in terms of um, Business Gateway and its transfer from Scottish Enterprise to local authorities, we've had 10 years where that transfer has been in place. Um, how effective has Business Gateway been over this last 10 years in your own sectors? We've all said it's 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 patchy in places. Um, some areas it's really proactive because the the business advisors on the ground really get it, and in some in some it's it's just not. I think it's difficult having a general service mm. um, that each each geography and each local authority has its own characteristics, its own own challenges with business growth rate, its own challenges. Um, with, with regeneration, with poverty, with, with a whole range of different things. Certainly from a Glasgow perspective, because we're based there, you know, the, the business death rate is really high. It's hard to attribute to why that is. It's been the case for a long time. Mm -hmm. We do know though, and I'm sure my colleagues would 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 see the same, we do know in a specialist environment for, from our perspective, our business death rate of who we support is very low um, because it's not general, it's specific. Mm -hmm. I think we certainly we've, uh, it's very it's very hard to answer because it, previously when it was outsourced beyond local authorities, mm. um, it was very patchy and now it's very patchy, right. but in quite a different way in some ways. Um, I think that the I would say on the whole it has improved. Personally, our experience has been better. That's been embedded in local authorities on the whole. Um, I think one of, this, one of the issues we find with our clients sourcing support from Business Gateway, uh, because of the unification, it feels like it's been tidied up a bit, um, but that kind of single brand, website, phone number kind of stuff, um, it, it, be, it doesn't feel very local. Um, you know, individuals on the ground can be very good, 
but the structure itself doesn't feel very locally responsive. Um, and a lot of people look at that and think, well, that's not for me, that's for like Amazon and all those guys. Yeah. Uh, there's, a real, there's a perception issue, I think. So we have to often break through that by saying, listen, don't worry, it's Jeannie Smith up at Fife House, she's lovely, there's the phone number. So there's a wee bit of bridge building sometimes. Um, Thanks so much, John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. And really, I think to follow on from some of the things uh, Gordon MacDonald was raising, um, the suggestion, again, of being a bit patchy around the country, and yet at the same time you're saying it, it's seen as a kind of national brand. Um, so I suppose, first of all, how, how are people, as far as you know, are they hearing about business gateways? I mean, you've indicated that it's through yourselves. In some cases, you're pointing people to business gateway. So are people not understanding what Business Gateway can offer? Are, are they not seeing advertising? Are they not seeing it online? What, what's the problem there? I think the problem is, is what I was referring to before, is the motivation that you come, on, come in with from our perspective. So, I mean, I'm speaking to a family member, for example, who's saying, I quite fancy starting a new business. I've got a couple of ideas. Business Gateway is obvious, obvious first port of call. But the social enterprises certainly we deal with are not coming from, largely not coming from the point of view of starting a business. Fiona is probably slightly different. But most of our guys are mm -hmm. coming from they've identified a need and then they try to work towards how do we solve that need in our community or thematic mm -hmm. area. And that begins to develop something that they want to become sustainable. We need to generate some money or this is going to close in three years. And, that, so that, and then at some point down the journey that has become a business. Mm -hmm. But by that time they've probably already had support from myself from Just Enterprise, from maybe Rachel, from Community Transport Association. So they're already embedded in more of a third sector support network. Mm -hmm. So um, they, won't, they won't look for or see Business Gateway because on the whole, they don't view themselves like that. Just one mm -hmm. very brief example, and I know time is short, but you know, perception is an issue. I was down in Inverclyde at a project who will never in a million years call themselves a business. Never. Mm -hmm. They're a community project, voluntary organisation. Um, but they get no grants from anyone. They've got £200,000 reserves in the bank. They made £35,000 last year, 45000 the year before. They work with refugees. They work with the poorest people in that community. They run an amazingly effective, efficient business. And would they benefit from Business Gateway, do you they think? They probably would, but they would never... They don't they would, think of themselves that way. Think of themselves do we need to change the name business. of Business Gateway, or how do we get around that? <laughs> well, that's the... Yeah, or yeah. to change the name of Social Enterprise. Or do business, gateway, do business Gateway need a bigger advertising budget to get their message out there? I think one of the challenges is, if, is when people have good experiences and bad experiences. <clears throat> so it's how people come to a service like Business Gateway. If you're a creative and you've had a poor experience or a patchy experience, any other creative person that asks you about your business journey oh, pass will, that on. will yeah. pass that on. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what happens within the network. If you have a great experience, it's the same. But because that's patchy, it's very difficult to measure that. Mm -hmm. Certainly in the communities that we also work and support in, where the young people may have not been successful at school for whatever reason, but actually are hugely creative. Maybe they're brilliant dance DJs and are running a club night and it's doing great and they need to formalise that and be pushed into a business. They wouldn't dream of going to Business Gateway because it's seen as an established or an establishment that, that isn't um, doesn't speak their language. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, multi it's, a, it's, a, it's quite complicated. It's a multitude of things. So if it's so patchy around the country, should we or somebody at the centre, the government or someone, be telling all the Business Gateways, all how 28 or however many there are, to get their act together and to ha to provide a very specific list of services. Would that be one way of dealing with this? Would that be effective though? Because it may be patchy just for our clients, but but that might be okay. So I know that's contradictory, mm -hmm. but but it, but actually, um, could it be that that if if it's patchy just in North Lanarkshire, for example, but they've been provide they've been signposted to a specialist service that 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 was the specialist service they should have had all along. It depends what you're trying to achieve with that, and I think we've got 32 local authorities, all with a completely different um, set of um, ambitious individuals that live within it. What do we want to achieve by telling mm -hmm. Business Gateway? To change and, and to do that, because would that would that be duplication? Yes. I mean, I think that's this is one of the questions of that course, we have as a absolutely. committee: is how how do you want to try and make it uniform, eh, and and maybe a little more more centralised? But on the other hand, we want to make it local and responsive and all the rest of it. And I, th I think we're kind of struggling to know what's the yeah. balance well, in I there. Think, yeah, I think no, it's totally. Just the, it's tricky because I think there's a 
there's a tendency, there certainly has been a tendency, and maybe we're all a bit like this as humans, I don't know, but there's a tendency in sex is to tidy things up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a bit of a mess out there, and there are all these quangos and supporting, which actually we're turning we'll turn them into some kind of nice, neat pipeline where people will come in here and they'll get it. Um, and people aren't like that. And I mean, our experience, people will find the support they need at some point or other. So in some ways, it just needs to be true to what it is. And the crucial thing is then about access is not so much about um, branding and unifying that, but about making sure, I mean, we're only three of us here and there's, you know, there'd be a, a tiny number of, uh, but there's hundreds of people providing business support. So I think, um, and it was mentioned, I think earlier on, that collaboration and intelligent cross-referral mm. is more effective than trying to sort business gateway, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that intelligent referral and better collaboration, uh, if we can make a bit of an effort to do that. In some ways, I think Rachel mentioned, that's a little bit about space. Everybody's just too busy. We've no breathing space to be creative and start thinking above the parapet. I really haven't spoken to Western Barnshire Business Gateway, and we're quite active in Western Barnshire. There's a gap in me. I need to take some time out to go and have a coffee with them, but I don't because mm. I'm too busy. So there's a wee bit around... Well, the is very committed to Western Barnshire, yeah, well, as you may realise. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, th that's fine. Uh, OK, well, thanks very much. That's great. Thanks. All right. Um, Jamie Halker johnson Thank you very much, Convener. I'm very conscious of the time. So I've got two, kind of two, two questions, really. Um, one, we kind of touched on the um, transparency of Business Gateway in terms of the kind of regional performance and process of a target setting. So I'd be interested to hear, kind of very briefly from the panel, the type of targets that you feel um, would be appropriate for assessing um, the success of Business Gateway and what they, what they achieve. And briefly, as I said before, I think as long as we make sure the target isn't always financial growth, is financial growth when it's appropriate, but the target might be sustainability. You know, I think if we have a, certainly businesses we work with, they want to be there in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but they don't want to be bigger, but they just want to be doing what they're doing. So sometimes that business support is supporting people to diversify and become more effective and cope with changes in the circumstances, things we've talked about, Brexit and other changes in the economy. Um, so sometimes that outcome is if they're still there 10 years time, but they've only still got three staff mm -hmm. and they're 50,000 turnover, that's a success story. Um, and obviously, you would expect this. My, my perspective is without social impact, without changing Scotland for the better, it's all largely pointless. So I mean, I know it's not the best business gateway's job, but really we do need to see more equalities. We need to see less poverty. We need to see uh, more people in work who are struggling to get work. We need to see refugees settled into their communities and contributing. Those are, I'm passionate about all those things. And uh, we need to see business as a means to an end to achieve those things. And I would certainly love to see those kinds of targets embedded in business gateways as crucial to mm -hmm. that economic picture. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, one of the challenges is, is sometimes there's maybe too much pressure to start a business, you know, take the box of we've created a business and that could potentially lead to actually a, a higher rate of business failure because actually people aren't ready to start a business but they've been encouraged to do that. So if the targets are number of business startups, that actually can be detrimental. But I think the other thing that's come through loud and clear is that Business Gateway is part of a very, very complicated ecosystem. System. And I think to say that, you know, that there are specific things that they are responsible for and they alone are responsible for, that's one of the biggest challenges. It's why, you know, when we look at the economic impact of what we do at SIE, it's actually very difficult because the people that we've supported that have done extremely well have actually had support from a lot of different agencies. So, you know, it, it's Team Scotland that you need to give the targets to rather than any specific institutions, which makes it very difficult and I think but it, it comes back to that actually um, messy is not always a bad thing mm -hmm. in fact messy can be a really good thing you don't want to be in a situation where there is a one-stop shop and everybody's expected to go through the same door and follow the same route um, I quite often use the analogy of not everybody's going to get everything they need from Tesco. Sometimes you need the individual, um, you know, the personal shopper and the individual high street um, specialist providers. Uh, so how do you measure that? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think so. One of the key things um, that's also come through loud and clear today is, is it's, it's about relationships, and it's about developing those relationships and understanding what's possible with those 
relationships. Certainly from our point of view, um, entrepreneurial activity and the impact of entrepreneurial activity from a social perspective, from an economic perspective and a creative perspective and an environmental perspective is really crucial. And some of the it, some of the measurements that we that we as specialist organisations put on ourselves very much link into that Team Scotland approach. And it would be great if um, Business Gateway was, was part of that yeah. rather than us feeling that we're, we're, we're quite far away from each other at the moment. I, I, I don't want to uh, get too much. You talked obviously about kind of a, the, a messy approach, and so that might be like, yeah. we'll, we'll start, Dean, on, uh, on cluttered landscapes if we're not careful. But, you know, you, you both mentioned kind of, ref you, you, I think you talked, um, uh, Fiona Goldman, about referrals and how um, you don't get referrals from Business Gateway, but you refer to Business Gateway. And I think um, um, uh, Rachel Brown mentioned um, uh, being under the radar. If that if that kind of thing is happening, is that is that um, I suppose being monitored by government in terms of the performance of the of the whole Team Scotland side of it, or are we are we perhaps missing out uh, on being fully aware of some of the things that actually do work very 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 well because they are kind of ad hoc. Well, I think we just an example. We are we are a delivery partner in Just Enterprise, the national social enterprise. Um, business support contract which is specialist to social enterprise I suppose um, and there is a KPI around uh, numbers of cross referrals to business gateway um, and I think the ad hoc thing can be an issue because you know we're certainly often contract manager will say, okay, I'm a wee bit low on this, what, and, and I'll thought, oh goodness, yeah, I forgot to tell you, because you just in your day-to-day -day work, you lift the phone and you speak to people, and just monitoring that is quite, can be quite challenging, but I know that's a KPI in that end, and I think they're mm -hmm. very keen that that cross-referral from Business Gateway to Just Enterprise and others um, uh, uh, continues and grows. Mm -hmm. Just last, last question then, um, about 15 million is spent on the kind of core services of Business Gateway, do you think that represents uh, value for money? Well, currently, our turnover is like 168,000. So um, I'm probably not the right person to ask. <laughs> um, I think that I, I think value for money is, is relative. I think um, I think it's about do we really know if we're going to be serious about business support across the country? Do we really know the mm. needs and wants and the understandings of all the businesses that we're creating and the supporting and the individuals we're creating and supporting? And I think for for for, my, for our perspective, certainly for our sector, you know our sector is growing slower than anybody else in the UK. Our sector um, needs a kind of varied approach, like everybody else's does, mm -hmm. and we just feel that we're too far away from all of the um, all of the support that could be possible. I think that's probably the the fair answer. I don't know whether it's good value for money. There was a question about whether we should be advertising more about Business Gateway, but actually perhaps one of the ways to advertise Business Gateway is actually to put the money into, instead of advertising campaigns, put the money into some small organisations that feed into and refer to Business Gateway could be a more effective way of reaching the people that need to be reached rather than necessarily the more conventional, and I speak as a marketer, and you know, um, rather than more conventional, marketing and, and uh, advertising of a service is actually how do we reach need to reach how do we reach and get the message to the people that need to know about it and actually it's probably more word of mouth peer-to-peer -peer, and actually putting some of the money instead of in advertising business gateway into these smaller uh, specialist organizations who will then refer the right people at the right time could be more cost-effective way of doing things. Thank you. I don't know if you've got anything to add, Doug. Well, I was just thinking if it was 14 instead of 15 and you just gave a million to us, we would do loads of great stuff <laughs> with it. And you'd hardly miss it. Um, I think in terms of best value, I mean, I literally, I literally don't know. You know, I literally don't know. There's, I mean, there's obviously, um, as I've said, social enterprise development, the, the um, strategy, there's money against that, there's money against business gateway, there's not very much money in the cultural enterprise office, but there is money. You know, there's money split if we spread it all out on the table. I think, to be honest, it's a hard question because we would have to look at it and, as you do in Parliament. You would have to look at it in the grand scheme of all the spend in Scotland. Yeah. Um, I am not meeting a lot of business gateway advisors who are sitting twiddling their thumbs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, about Vest, but honestly, I don't know because I haven't looked at their impact. 15 million does, it doesn't seem a massive amount in terms of pr promoting the Scot Scottish economy at a local level. So you could tinker around the edges by removing some funding or increasing some funding, but it, um, I don't know is the honest answer, but it doesn't seem ridiculous to me. Okay.
Thank you very much. Okay. All right, thank you very much, and um, we'll leave it there, and I'm sure we'll find the money, uh, not uh, the missing money, or not lose, lose the money. And uh, thank you very much for coming in. And we'll move on as a committee to item three as our witnesses um, uh, leave us. Um, I, item three is consideration of three proposals by the Scottish Government to consent to UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to proposed UK statutory instruments. Uh, the first of these United Kingdom statutory instruments is the Provision of Services Amendment etc. EU Exit Regulations 2018. Um, the Provision of Services Regulations 2009, by way of explanation, established the legal framework for the UK's membership of the EU Single Market and Services. The proposed statutory instrument would amend those regulations to reduce the scope of their application in the event of a no deal with the European Union. Secondly, the CRC Energy Efficiency Scheme Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018 um, provide for a scheme which is UK-wide to incentivise energy efficiency. The proposed United Kingdom statutory instrument would ensure that exemptions defined in EU law continue to be available between exit day on 29th March and the closure of that scheme on 31st March. And finally, the INSPIRE Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018 relate to an EU directive which established a European spatial data infrastructure with an aim to improve environmental policy making. The proposed statutory instrument will correct deficiencies that would arise or will arise from exit from the European Union. Now, the notification for these regulations indicates that they are all Category A proposals. That is to say, they are technical with minimum policy choice or only one obvious policy solution. Is the committee content for these matters to be dealt with by statutory instruments at Westminster? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And if, since the committee is content, I will write to the Cabinet Secretary and the relevant ministers to notify them of the committee's decision. And we'll now move into private session. And we'll have a short break of five or ten.